Welcome to the Seahawks Man to Man podcast powered by The Athletic. Shout out to the company. My name is Michael Sean Dugar. You can follow me on whatever Elon Musk is calling that social media app these days. You can follow me there at Mike Dugar, M-I-K-E-D-U-G-A-R. Shout out to everyone who subscribes to our YouTube channel, Seahawks Man to Man. That is man, the number two man on YouTube. We appreciate the love and support. Chris, talk to him. What is good, everybody? It is your boy, Christopher Kidd. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at CKIDD206, and that's CKID206. Speaking of YouTube, what was it? Maybe, I think it was Friday, three days ago. No, Thursday or Friday, whatever. I went on there and went to our community on YouTube, and I typed in, 12s, how are y'all feeling about their upcoming game against the Lions? A, I'm confident they'll bounce back and win. B, I don't know how to feel right now, or C, sorry, 0-2 start. Mike, if you had to guess where a majority of the votes went, where do you think they went, C, B, or A? Um, probably C, the the doomsday one, the 0-2 would be my guess. Yes, you are correct. 43% said, sorry, 0-2 start. 39%, though, I don't know how to feel right now, and 18%. So shout out to that 18% that, are, that were confident that the Seahawks would bounce back and get the victory. So I just want to plug those those listeners because they 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 stuck with this team. Although it wasn't a pretty start week one against the the Rams where they got beat down really bad, they said, you know what? They're going to bounce back in Detroit after Detroit's huge win against the Chiefs to kick off the NFL season. What, they have 10 days off, Mike, before they played again? The, the Lions, that is. So shout out to those 18 percenters because, like you said, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone was thinking it's a wrap. 0-2 start. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, that's that, credit to them for believing on um, the Seahawks obviously did bounce back. If you listen to this, you already know that they beat the, the Lions in Detroit 37 to 31 uh, in overtime. Big, big win, big time bounce back. Uh, a lot of people did a lot of important things in this game. We'll probably cover just about everybody uh, in this one, though. I, I, I do think I want to start with giving some credit to uh, I mean, not credit necessarily, but I think today was a good. Today and this week was a good illustration of Bobby's value beyond however many tackles or whatever he makes. And I say that because on Monday after losing to the Rams, Monday and Tuesday, and Pete Carroll admitted this too, I had kind of already, we kind of got a sense for it, but it was nice for Pete to say it. On Monday and Tuesday, Pete tried to be like, all right, guys, flush that loss. We got to move on. Like we can't carry that loss into this week as we prepare for the, the Lions. That just won't work. And the message, for whatever reason, just was not getting through. Because when guys showed up on Wednesday, there was still some kind of aura of like, oh, y'all still hung up on that? Like, that was three days ago or whatever. So Bobby just took it upon himself to step up and be like, yo, yo, we, that's, dope, that's done. Just be where your feet are at. Be right here. Be present. You can't do anything about the past. All you can do is be in the present to, you know, impact the future. So I'm paraphrasing, but that's what Bobby told the team. I believe that was before Wednesday's practice. Um and when I was talking to guys in the locker room this week, you could kind of tell that that speech more than anything kind of led to a good day Wednesday, carry over into a good day Thursday with a lot of energy, a lot of juice. The team kind of felt like, you know, what, we are we we are who we think we are. The Rams game wasn't who we are. We're going to get a chance on Sunday to actually show who we are. And that was a feeling that was they were kind of piggybacking that feeling off of what Bobby had kind of given them some impassioned speech before practice. Um, and obviously that carried into the game. You know, they they got they took some punches. They threw some punches. It was a good old fashioned slugfest here in Detroit again. Um, and they came out on top. But, you know, you could tell part of it was believing the message that Bobby said, like, yo, we, we got to forget about week one. We got to learn from it. We can't just let dwell on it. And it didn't carry into week two. Week two was its own little like narrative, storyline, ski masks on the road. Hmm. Um, some new guys in there with Jake and, and, and Stone uh, playing tackle. Boy, Mafe out. Um, so DT back in the lineup. You know, 
So, you know, Spoon's debut. So they looked at it as its own entity and behaved accordingly, behaved like who they thought they could be, clutched up, and then won the game. Um, when Bobby was gone last year, those moments were missing. And already you can see the impact. Like, that's the that's the difference that Bobby Wagner can make. That you can't really feel it in the, in the stats or the film, but – Right there was this week was such a perfect illustration of like, yeah, that's the value of having a veteran who guys respect in the building to be like, hey, this is what we need to do. Let's do it. And everybody's like, oh, well, OK, Bobby says so they were going to go do it. You know, like if the message got through from a, if the players listened to another player and the players will tell you that all the time, like sometimes the message just hits different from your peer or even, you know, sometimes your position coach is not getting to you. Sometimes your head coach is not getting to you. Sometimes you got to hear from one of your brothers out there in war with you. So shout out to uh, Bobby on that. Like that's just a good illustration of this, what he can bring to a team, what he or any veteran can bring to a team, um, you know, beyond any tackles or catches or throws. Cause sometimes you need that. Even Pete admitted after the game, was like, yeah, I, the message didn't get through from me. Bobby got it through. So, and, and that helped. Cause boy, Chris, if they didn't listen to Bobby, they would have been on a long plane ride back home to, to Seattle, sitting in the back of the plane because, you know, the, the players have to the players get to ride first class when they win on the road. Um, so right now, as we're recording, they they comfy, they chilling, they feeling good. Everybody's got space. You know, all the big boys are probably really happy because they listened. They remembered, you know, Jackson Smith and Jigba told me this week, he's like, we just needed to remember who we are. And I was like, who are you guys? He's like, we're a dominant team. Like, doesn't mean we're going to go blow everybody out. But that does mean that we're going to go in there and be dominant. And I was like, I get the difference. Hopefully that made sense to you guys hearing that. Because it did when Jackson said it to me. I was like, yeah, that makes sense. You're not going to blow everybody out. This isn't college. But you are. You can be a dominant team. And that means execution. Um, that means being tough. And that means, like we saw today, being clutch. It's a big boy drive by Gino in that offense. In overtime, 75 yards on the road. Uh, with 66,000 fans, a good third of them wearing ski masks, which was a very weird trend to see, seeing middle-aged white folks in Detroit wearing ski masks and dressed like Pooh Shiesty. It was like, it was very, people tweeting me like, what's up with the ski masks? And I'm like, I can't even explain it to some of you guys. Like, if you just don't get it, you just don't, it ain't for skiing. Uh, I'll tell you that. <laughs> that way. Yeah. That's the only thing I can say is ain't no, ain't no, ain't no skiing going on with the masks. But in that environment, yeah, that was you, the veteran leadership showed up today. There were some other guys that contributed too, but like I think that um, Chris, that's something that that stood out on top of the poise that some of the veterans showed within the face of adversity. With um, Jags, Jackson Smith and Jigba again, he mentioned to me he was like, "Man, I was a little nervous, a little bit there, you know, with all the roller coaster events of the game, all the big swings." And he was like, what helped me was just looking at DK, looking at Tyler, looking at Gino, how they were cool. They were calm. They were collected. So he was like, I, I was good, you know? So, like, that – man, the, the veteran stuff showed up today. Some younger guys played well too, but, like, this was a – this win in a lot of ways was a really good example of having veteran leadership. Um, like, you can get younger and faster and put draft picks on the field as much as you want. That's cool. But sometimes it's like, now nah, we need some adults on the team. And today they needed some adults because an immature team would have got blown out the building because yeah. Detroit was ready. Oh yeah, you, Dan Campbell, great coach in this league, and he he got those players ready to to play. As you mentioned, the Seahawks did face adversity going into the third quarter. They're down, and they need a going spark. into the fourth. They were down, I believe. Um, yeah. So they 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 faced adversity a couple of times, but going into that third specifically. And for Nuosu to, who has been quiet for the most part this season, all right? He hasn't been as effective as you would think someone that's being paid the amount of dollars. I know people would equate that to his performance on the field. But he, in this game on Sunday against the Lions, that third quarter, their first attempt on the ground, what does he do? He rips the ball away from David Montgomery. That's a great play. Great play. And that's why you're paying him. The Seahawks get the ball, and what do they do? They respond immediately. And that's the type that 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 was good to see from this Seahawks team because you could have they could have mailed it when well, I mailed it and they could have went out there, worked their ass off, tried, tried and tried. And Jared Goff marches on the field, a touchdown. Now you're thinking, OK, they're in a really tough spot. Defense can't stop anything. And now what what is Gino going to do? 
can Geno really get this team going? Is he going to make multiple plays, multiple drives here where they're scoring touchdowns and hope that the defense get one stop and Geno can tie it up some point in the game? It didn't come to that. It came down to Uchenna getting off, destroying, I think it was Laporte on that play, a tight end, just blowing him up, meeting Montgomery in the backfield, just taking the ball away, and that changed the momentum. That brought that got the life going again that the Steelers were thinking, yes, we could beat these guys. I know they were down. David Montgomery looked like he might rush for 100-plus yards, all right? Ultimately, that didn't happen. They got the fumble. They scored. And from there, the Seahawks just kept building and building and building. A couple of mental lapses here and there. But ultimately, at the end of the day, when the score was – when the dust was settled, the Seahawks were victorious. And that's what you want to see. You want to see a team that is going to continue to fight. Hell, I remember seeing Pete Carroll jumping up and down to start the fourth quarter, getting those guys ready. Like, I know his – one of his big things that he says is, can you win the game in the first quarter? Can you win the game in the second quarter? You guys know that speech. In the fourth quarter, they delivered. They finished. They got the win. Huge performance by Geno Smith. And got a, I know you gave credit to Bobby Wagner and what he did as a leader, but also got to show love to the two tackles. All right? Jake Curran and Stone Forsyth. Two backup tackles that a lot's on their plate. The Lions know... They got two rook, not rookies, two young guys in there filling in. And it didn't phase those two young guys. They did their job. And I love how Shane called the game with a lot of play action, just trying to keep those linebackers honest, keep them thinking, okay, they're going to try to run the football. And you look at Ken, outside of Ken Walker's two touchdowns, he didn't have the greatest day running the football. I know Mike has said this in past in the past that, hell, I see Kenneth Walker getting the ball and there's a linebacker in his face. Ken did a lot of making guys miss on Sunday. He was able to make the first guy miss, running east and west, but he didn't, not too many plays did he lose that, did he lose yards. And I know it was tough for those tackles, but I think they did a good job and I loved how Shane called the game. And speaking of Shane calling the game, I, I will show love the tight ends because they had 10 catches for over 100 plus yards on Sunday. That's Will Disley, Kobe Parkinson, and Noah Fant. And Mike was able to look up this cool little stat. Out of Six out of those 10 catches all came out of play action. So the Seahawks took it to their advantage. We're going to keep giving the ball to Ken and Zach Charbonnet. It might not be working as much and as well as it needs to, but at the end of the day, it's going to keep the Detroit Lions, okay, they're going to run the football. Psych, no, it's a play action pass. You'll find your Noah. You'll find a Will Disley. You'll find a Kobe Parkins. We had a big play in the late in the game to keep the drive moving. And that's what you wanted to see. And they were they were able to execute with those two tackles in there. So I wanted to show love to Jake and Stone for stepping in. And they're probably going to have to do it a few more times until guys are healthy. But as Gino said in the post game, he loved those dudes, gave them, showed them love nationally and told them face to face. And that's what you do as a as a leader of the team. You 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 try to encourage those young guys because <laughs> they are trying to protect you. And if they don't trust you or have some type of feeling about you that you're not doing what you need to do on the field, you don't know how that can go. So I applaud those guys for stepping up and doing their jobs. And the Seahawks walked out, walked out of there with the victory. Yeah, nine catches for 132 yards um, for the Titans. Oh, it was nine? See, CBS yeah, Sports got me good. messed yeah. up, man. They said, let me see, let me see here. They gave Noah Fant four, Parkinson three, and then Will Disley you know, I can't I can't read, Mike. Ignore me. It is nine catches. Yeah, par uh Parkinson only had two. He had three targets. Oh, the, That's probably what yeah, yeah, I see the targets. Now that I'm looking at it, there's a big T A R over the top. <laughs> so yeah, yeah nine so, catches. So six out of the nine, excuse me, were all under play action, which was really cool to see. Yeah, no, very and they uh and I, I believe they had six, yeah, they had six first down catches. Um those tight ends did. Mm. Uh and they all had at least one explosive catch. Colby had a twenty one. Will had a 16, and then uh, Noah had a 31. A explosive, an explosive pass is counted as like anything that's 16 or more yards. An explosive run is 12 or more yards. So just for just for reference, yeah, Shane, uh, I have my gripes with Shane Waldron as a play caller. As we will Go get into it, some man. of these, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. We can we can wait. We got time. We got time. Uh, but yeah, today today I do think um, he was he was really he was on it. He was on it and adjusted well a little bit too, because after a while, those tackles didn't even need that much help or anything. After a while, it was just trusting your guy. And that's who the the other guy, when I was like leaving the stadium and rewatching the game before we recorded, I was like, wow, this was a really good Geno day. 
Um, and I don't even think Gino was necessarily like bad in the first game. Uh, it just wasn't like super good. Uh, but in in this game, I was like, yo, Gino was Gino was on it. The pocket presence was good. Great uh, man, I love the throws. Him. The throws yeah. were accurate. Um, yeah, he was just he was just making it happen. He was taking what the defense is giving him, uh, using his legs uh, when he needed to. Like, uh, yeah, I thought. I thought it was a, a really solid by him. And then the big boy drive at the end, that's always like, it's the time when it's, you get into overtime. I loved how confident everyone was and how confident everyone described Gino as after the game. Like I asked, I think it was Colby Parkinson after I was like, what was Gino like, you know, after the, taking the 17 yard sack, which was just egregious. <laughs> that, that was outside of his <laughs> almost pick six he threw. That was one of the worst <laughs> decisions he made. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's pretty bad. Um, <laughs> That that's I don't know what was going on right there. Uh, I missed his press conference, so I don't know if somebody asked him about that. But that was that was terrible. Uh, but after that, to bounce back from that and just be like, "Yo, locked in." Like guys were saying, like he was just he was fine. He was just himself. He flushed it pretty quick. Like you could see, he flushed it. He doesn't really need like a pep talk or you to go slap him on the helmet. He's just like, "Nah, it's over. I can't do nothing about that sack. All I can do right now is we got the ball on the twenty-five. We about to go knock this out." Colby was like, "Yeah, he was straight." Same thing with DK. He was like, yeah, no, he's fine. He came back in the huddle in overtime. He said, let's go down there, execute, score, and win the game. They went down there, executed, scored, won the game. Like that credit credit to him because that can that can be tough. That's one of those things that also you can get a younger, cheaper quarterback. Um, it's, that's a whole different discussion in terms of like resource allocation. But that's those type of moments, those character traits of your quarterback are hard to just like just put into a young guy. To just be like, all right, there's 60 something thousand people here, really hoping that I fail. They're going crazy right now. We're in overtime. I just screwed up. Uh, like, I need us to go. And I, I can't necessarily, he's probably not thinking this, but he's like, I can't necessarily trust that our defense will get a stop because they've given up a 30 ball already. So it's like, I got, I got to go get this done. I got backup tackles. Like you mentioned, it's like, you know what? I'm going to stand in here with these pass rushers coming. And I'm, I'm going to make these plays. No, yeah, shout out to Gino. I thought today a lot of guys did a lot of things, as we'll get to in the questions, but in particular it was like the veteran stuff, Gino and Bobby in particular, two captains, which you need you need the captains to show up every game, but particularly on the road. Yeah. Like, yeah, those those guys, the throws, everything, this is one of those days. What Gino have? Today was 328 for two touchdowns. Yeah, 32 of 41, good percentage. Um, yeah, he was just on it. He was, he was on it again, man. And that the throw to Tyler to win it, pretty wow. simple throw, but like it was just it was on the money. You know, he threw some balls that let his guys get some yak today, particularly Will Disley. Um, I was telling, uh, I think I was telling Noah Fat, I was like, when you go watch the film, go watch Will. He's already just uh, getting guys off of him. Just uh, get off me. Uh, very, very uh, low key yak monster. Will Disley pr- proved to be, uh, but yeah, Gino, I thought was. Like Bobby did it. Bobby did the lead up, and then on the field, it was, you know, it was like, yeah, I'm I'm locked in. I'm gonna go get us this win. So, and like it's like we talked about in the open, they needed that so goddamn bad. Mm-hmm. Oh, and two would have been like panic button, press it with no hesitation. Like not even like somebody can talk you off the ledge. No, no, no. It would have been time to press it. People would have been looked pointing fingers. Probably, hey, you do your job. You did blah blah blah. You did this. You did that. Now everybody's just laid back, relaxing on the flight home and can tell the truth Monday can feel a lot, a lot better. Uh, they still got some stuff to fix. Jason Myers um, still got Jeez, some stuff man. to fix secondary. Oh uh, my God. Yeah. We'll get, to, yeah, we can get to that with the questions, but uh, yeah, really good, really good win that salvages, not salvages the season. Cause it's early, but yeah. an Owen two start would have just been just, it's just not what you want. <laughs> it would have been, it would have after an Owen two start after getting your butt whooped at home would have just been like, damn man. This is this is rough. They probably still would have came and beat the Panthers in week three, like I expect them to. But now it's like, all right. Like I said, it reassured, like, okay, we are who we thought we were, and went and showed it in a really tough place to win. And you know what was cool was seeing young Devin Witherspoon get out there. I know he was excited. He got some burn. He made some mistakes, and he also made some plays. And it was good to see the Seahawks highest pick in the 2023 NFL draft go out there and just play ball it the hamstring is good he was moving doing his thing he had a play where I think everyone tweeted that's why the Seahawks took him (laughs) and that felt good to see 
him display why the Seahawks picked him so high because of his ability to cover and just play ball. So that's what I did want to add before we jumped into Twitter questions. Is there anything else you want to add before we do so, Mike? No, let's do it. I think there's a Devin question in there, too, we can get to. All right, let's get it rolling. We got a few Twitter questions. So, again, we want to thank each and every single one of you for taking the time to ask questions. We appreciate all the love and support. I'll go to my DMs because I got a few. So to start things off, we'll start with the defense. And this is from the homie Shiv Ramdas. Is Trey Brown the best third cornerback in football? <laughs> that's, that's a funny one. Let Trey tell you he's the number one cornerback. Um, right? I mean, I guess he came off the bench today. But, uh, yeah, no, man, Trey can, Trey can ball. I, I believe I, I think I mentioned this. I'm pretty sure I have on the podcast before that he kind of reminds me of like a Marcus Peters, Trevon Diggs type where it can be a roller coaster sometimes, but he's going to make that play that changes things like today with the sack, with the pick six right after that, it was just like, yo, this is it. Like, this is, this is the guy, this is the stuff he was doing in Oklahoma. Um, and then I think he gave up a touchdown later and was like, ah, uh, you talked mm. about it, Mike. Do you remember when you said Trey will have a good play and then he'll have a bad play? Do you remember that? Yeah. I think it was yeah, a preseason I, game. Yeah. And I, and I, I don't, I think it was a preseason game cause he had a pick or, yeah, I think it was a preseason game where he gave a touchdown against the Vikings. I want to say. Yeah, the tight end caught one, and you're like, "Who the hell yeah. is this?" Muse. Yeah. So it's it's, but like he he's he's good for those game changers, man. He can do. It's what he did in college. He was he made game changing plays in college. It's not like he just had a lot of plays in college. He had like, I think he clinched like back to back Big Twelve championships with interceptions. I think actually he clinched one with a sack. I want to say then one with a pick. Um, I think he had a kick return touchdown in a big game in college. Like he was just a gamer. Um, and today was a really good example of him being a gamer. Uh, he can do it. I know some people want him moved in the slot, but now he's real comfortable on the outside, man. He can do it. He didn't get targeted a ton. Um, unfortunately for his numbers, he did get targeted for that. I'm on raw play at the end of the first half. That's a, that's like 40 yards on your, on your stat sheet. That sticks. Cause that play just didn't really mean didn't anything. Mean anything. <laughs> yeah. And I'm on raw fumbled on it too. Um, but and I don't know why they were pressed up on like a Hail Mary situation. The whole thing was weird. But anyway, <laughs> to answer Ship's question, probably yes, because I do believe that the Seahawks have four starting caliber outside corners. I do not know how many teams have that. Like that's really, really impressive. Um, they have De Spoon, I think, is a starting caliber guy, projecting a little bit because he's literally played one game, but I think Spoon is that. I, I think Michael Jackson is that. He's got an entire season of body of work to show it. Trey Brown is proving that. Uh, as well so um i'm missing somebody oh reek duh um so they, i think they got four and that's that's and they're all on rookie deals um i believe so yeah that's just really that's good work they they got they got it so yeah i think trade my pro he probably is that said i don't know everybody's third corner but i don't know how many teams legitimately have three starting caliber outside corners that's that's tough work by the seahawks do you think this will let me not just ask the question. This is from Phil Birnbaum. Do you think Trey Brown has shown enough to be a starter with the Seahawks going forward? Unfortunately, I don't think so. I, I really, because I really think that Reek and and Spoon is probably going forward going to be their best duo. It'll be interesting to see how much of like a leash Spoon gets to make mistakes because he was responsible for a few explosives today. You know, he gets beat on the flea flicker for the touchdown. Um, he gets a, de a defensive pass interference um, on the play before the flea flicker. Um, he also gave up a 20 yarder to I think Josh Reynolds. Um, it was, there was an offsides on there, but that doesn't really affect the coverage of what happened. So he also had a PBU on fourth down. So I don't, it's like, and he was, uh, he had the incompletion going his way on fourth down twice in that play. So it's, it's, it's very tough. Um, I would say like, assuming Reek is fine. Cause we don't know that Reek, Reek says he's fine, but uh, we'll see. You guys know that Pete Carroll might be the most untrustworthy coach in the history of football when it comes to injuries. So um, like it was so funny today. Um, I think we had a Reek question in here too, but I'll, I'll skip forward and just talk about it. Uh, Pete Carroll, after he sees, gets asked like, Oh, is Tariq Willen okay. And then he's like, yeah, he just banged his shoulder. And then I think it was uh, Brady Henderson, the ESPN who was like, 
okay, but they announced that it was his chest. So what's wrong? And then Pete was like, I don't know, man. He just, and Pete like just touched his own like pectoral area, like collarbone ish area and was like, it's, it's, it's up here. I just know it's sore. And it's just like, <laughs> you're killing me, dog. You're killing me. Like, what do, what do we do with that? Like, what do we do with that? And it was so funny because, um, so in, in the post game locker room, the locker room is usually a, a, a quite a bit of a distance away from the, where the actual, like where they get interviewed and where the locker room is are kind of far away. So you kind of have to choose like right after the game, like Pete Carroll walked by me to go do the, the post game and the locker room opened. So I'm like, Oh, where do I go? I was gone. I was like, Oh man, why don't I go to the Pete thing first to just see what he says about Reek. And then I got halfway there and I was like, he ain't about to say nothing about Reek, man. And then just walked into the locker room. And that's exactly why <laughs> those type of updates, Pete just rubbing his chest. talking about it's up there somewhere. What you mean, man, they give you a sheet. They give you a sheet. <laughs> That tells you what's wrong with anybody. Anyway, so no, I think that if, if Reek's fine, I think you still go with Reek and Spoon, but um, that's just you just have two starting caliber corners on your on your bench, man. I mean, maybe you cross train somebody to play nickel, but I think that that's just the way you gotta you gotta operate right now, knowing that if something does happen to Spoon or Reek, that Trey can come in and impact the game for you. This next one comes from Emmanuel Medhane. Is it time for the secondary to have a have an accountability meeting? Outside of that pick six with Trey Brown, looks like it was subpar. Yeah, the secondary still has some some issues, though. I, I don't. It's a it's a it sucks because it's a little bit of everything, man. Like Trey gave up a touchdown. They got beat on the flea flicker. Um, Julian Love uh, was not good in coverage. Um, looks like the second straight game. It's very. It's not looking like a good uh, free agent signing. At least right now, it's early, but like the early returns have not been like. Have not been good. It's like some plays here and there, but then it's just like, dude, that you got to make that play last weekend and today. Uh, so yeah, something's got to change there. Um, they didn't get carved up with a ton of middle of the field stuff, but guys still running open. Um, I think a big, the big chunk of like, like the 40 yard of to Amon Ra, you can even probably cut out as well, uh, just because it was like a nothing Hail Mary situation. But even when you cut that out, Jared throws for actually he doesn't throw for as much. It, it goes under to 300 when you when you drop that one. But yeah, I just think too many explosives again today. They had one play where Sam Laporta was just wide open in the middle of the field, and I'm talking like nobody within like 15 yards of him. Uh, I went back and looked at all the explosives that Jared had. Uh, looks like Spoon was responsible for two of them. Um, one of them was the the, the big throw to Amon Ra, and then I think the rest were just Julian Love. Which is so that's, that right there is kind of like th- it's just three dudes, but like that's three dudes who are going to play a lot. So like it's yeah, something something's got to change there. I will say this: if they don't have like an accountability meeting, jobs are going to be up for grabs here in practice. I think that's why what's going to happen is if you go there and you're like, all right, no one's starting spot is guaranteed today. Today we just the best guys will play. That includes Jamal when he gets back. Um, that includes Reek and, and Trey and Spoon and Mike Jack. Like everybody gets to compete for it. Make Quandre's up for grab too if you want to do it. Like the bet, uh, Artie and Kobe as well at, at Nickel. Like every DB job is up for grabs. Go. That may be the the, the solution because uh, yeah, today was today they just found a different way to give up explosives. <laughs> Again, a lot of them, half of them looks like they were just Julian, but it was Julian and Spoon that made up like ninety percent of them, but. Still, those are guys that they're going to be counting on. So what do you do? How do you put the pressure on the guys? I don't have a good answer for that one. Um, but, yeah, something, something's got to get right because as much as um, the Panthers got a young quarterback and stuff like that, like, they're still going to fail. Guys are going to find it. They're going to find your weakness and attack it. And if the Panthers find a way to do that with who they got at quarterback and who they got thrown to them, man, then it's really – then you start looking at maybe the coaches like, man, you, whatever you guys are telling these guys ain't getting to them. Mm. This next one comes from Eric at Tweets Are Dumb. The Lions look very different after Montgomery went down. Can the Seahawks beat an opponent with a strong, consistent running game? Yeah, I think so. I think the Seahawks' run defense has actually been pretty decent. What did the running backs do today? Let me look at so that. Before Mon- so when Montgomery went down, he was, what, 16 for 67 yards in a tug, and then they shut down Gibbs. Yeah, I think he had 7 for 17, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the running backs had... Um, all three running backs for Detroit had 26 carries for 91 yards. That's three and a half yards a carry. 
uh, one touchdown. That was by Montgomery. They ran for four first downs total. Um, that's a first down rate of about 15%, which I think is lower than last week. I think last week they only allowed like 18%. Um, so yeah, I actually think that the, I think the numbers are decent. I think their run defense is pretty good. Like their run defense on the rundowns in particular is really good. Like now they've just found a new issue where when they get in dime on third down teams, just run it up. Run the it, yeah. like, <laughs> smart. It's like, Jesus, if it ain't one thing, it's another. It's just very smart by the lions and Rams to just kind of yep. put that wrinkle in. Um, it, I would do it, too. it was the same type of play too. I think it was a trap play both times. Um, yeah, last right weekend, up this week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we just let somebody come up free and then you just bring somebody else around it. Uh, smack. Them. Uh, yeah, that was a, uh, that part. So that's like, for example, that play goes into the run numbers, right? But that's not necessarily like your run unit. You know what I mean? Like Artie yeah, Burns. Third and eight. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it's, you got your dime defense in there. You're thinking so they're going like to throw the ball and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, I think the run defense actually is fine. That's probably one of the that's probably the only thing the defense has been consistently good at in the last couple of weeks is like getting um getting the run game corralled. Like, yeah, running backs are gonna get there. It's like you're not gonna hold everyone to under like 50 yards or something. But I do think just looking at what the running backs did today, like if I was to just look at early downs too, let me look at early downs. First and second down numbers by the running backs today. 20 carries for 64 yards. That's that's a good day on the ground. I um, mean, that's a good day defending the run, I would say. So um, yeah, I think I think the run defense is fine. I don't think that um, you got they need to make any drastic changes there. I think guys are doing good. You really some of it is just tackling better. Like one play, I yes, think DT I I got the say. guy all on. The, I forget. I think it was Montgomery. Like DT gets in there and he would have had a TFL, and he then all of a sudden him. he just lost him. Yeah, and he breaks <laughs> free for like four more yards. So I think the way they're leveraging themselves and putting themselves in position and playing off of one another is fine. To be honest, they just keep making tackles. I think they'll they'll be okay stopping them. That that's exactly what I was gonna hit on. The tackling is an issue because Montgomery had a couple of them where he's hit by one dude and he just carries them for four or five yards. And I'm thinking, if you just make the tackle, it's a one yard gain. But running backs get they were getting paid on the offensive end. Yeah. Too, so but the the numbers are bearing it out. The numbers and the uh. The, the, the Seahawks, gotta, I got to check at the end of the year, but Jesus, I feel like the Seahawks are probably going to lead the league in um, TFLs against the run. They're getting a lot each week, man. Like the Seahawks, like Chenna had I had some today. Yeah, the fourth fumble tackle for loss. There it is. Yeah, and then uh, Mario <laughs> Edwards had one today. I want to say Jay Reed, Reed had one. Yeah, he did. He did. I'm yeah, pretty sure the, he did. Their numbers are – if Jay Reed didn't have one, he got in there and made it happen. When they went forward on fourth down – one of those times today, Jay it, was because they, it was because they failed on third and one and Jay Reed got in there and maybe someone else ended up getting the TFL, but it was created by Jay Reed. The point is the run defense, I think is probably the best thing they do right now. So no, I think they can beat a team that has a good run game. Yes. This next one comes from Jerome Lyons. Why is the D line able to penetrate on run plays, but then on pass plays, it's, it doesn't, it's not working out. That's a good question. I don't have a super great answer to it. I don't know necessarily how much of it is scheme. For example, I think that like when I went really back and watched the Rams game of the all 22, the scheme itself was okay. And I think it was great. Guys just were not on this. It looked like guys did not play with each other ever. You got, you got guys pointing. Like there was one play where you can Julian love sees Higby coming across Kobe's in that zone. Julian says, Hey, Kobe guard him. Kobe doesn't hit first down like stuff like that, right in the middle of the field, stuff like that. So I think the, the communication needs to be a little better. Like that was a good example of that. Um, I think they need to be a little stickier covering guys. Um, but also I think that right now the pass rush is not helping as much as it could. Cause you see like one of those plays, Jared Goff got rushed, got off of his spot threw a bad ball. Like when you get these quarterbacks off their spot, their accuracy drops off. That's why it's so impressive when guys can be off their spot and throw well, like Mahomes. Like you can get Mahomes off his spot. We didn't see Mahomes throw, jump in the air like the Matrix and hit a guy in his face in the Super Bowl. Like he's one of those guys you get him off his spot, it doesn't matter. But some of these other guys, like Goff, for example, it does. You just got to get them off of their spot, and they're they're not doing enough a good enough job of that to help the secondary out right now. And then those guys are not doing uh, a good enough job themselves on the back end. But I do think the other thing is the answer to that question is they have some really good run defenders, like really, really, really good. Like Jay Reed is really, really, really good against the run. 
Bobby is really, really, really good against the run. Um, Chenna is really, 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 really good against the run. Boye is really, really, really good against the run. They think they have a, quite a few due to some of the best stuff they do is against the run. Uh, I think that plays into it uh, as well. And then with the pass rush stuff, they're not getting home fast enough, and then guys aren't sticky enough in cover. It's like it's just not all working together as well as it is with the with the passing game. And I think some of that is just due to some of these guys that just beasts uh, in the pat in the run game, like Chenna, Jay Reed, and Bobby. In other words, the marriage through two weeks isn't going as planned as you think it should <laughs> regarding the D line and the secondary. This yeah. next one is from the homie over in Germany, Thorsten. After two games, is the glass half full or half or half empty? That's a good question. Um, I'm actually not sure. I would lean closer to like a half full situation because I do think the offense, like the offense clearly is going to be good. I think that they're like today was a really good example of like, yo, they can do it. Even on a day, Ken's not rushing for a bunch, and they got backup tackles in. It was like we can, we can, we can ball. I think the throwing game is is going to consistently be there. Um, I, I I thought it was really telling when DK Metcalf said on Wednesday, it was like, yeah, I just I just wasn't locked in, you know, for our season opener. That's why I didn't play well. Um, which is you really don't want to hear that, but I mean, you want to hear the accountability part of it. Good on him admitting it, but going forward, you can tell that's just not going to be an issue. I think the throwing game. Is going to be really good. Their quarterback is trustworthy. He trusts his protection. He's accurate. Um, he's got good receivers. Like so, that that gives a glass half full thing. And I do think they have talent in the secondary. I think part of it is just maybe finding the right combination of it. Like maybe that's Spoon at nickel full time, Trey Brown on the outside, Reek on the outside, Jamal and Quandre. Maybe that's the combo. I do think maybe. Getting everyone healthy and on the field will allow them to say hey, this is the best combo. So that that's maybe one way to view it as because the run game is fine on both ends. I think the run game will be fine. Um, pass game, I think, will be fine. Secondary, I feel like the pieces are there. They just got to get them all out there. Like I do think, like if you guys don't see Jamal's value now, I just don't know what you're looking at. Like there's there's room for Jamal to be very productive in this defense. So if he plays against Carolina, I think we may see like, okay, this is what it's supposed to look like. So maybe that's a good way to view it as a glass half full situation. This next one comes from at Savage Cookie. Do you think Clint and BT Jordan should be on the hot seat after two weeks? Um, I don't think after two weeks, anyone's on the hot seat per se in this particular situation. I think other parts around the league, maybe. Like uh, that guy in the Chargers, that might <laughs> be uh, Staley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be uh, that, that seat might be it. It should have been warm on that flight from Jacksonville um, in mm. the playoffs. Now it should be. Uh, it should be like, damn, how do I turn this seat down? The temperatures up. Like it's yeah, it should it should be that. Um, I don't I don't think so because even I do think the scheme. This is specifically looking at the Clint part of that question. I think the scheme is there. Like the more I'm looking at, I'm like, okay. They can do it like today, like they're doing a lot of single high stuff, um, which was fine. You know, Detroit's got a really good run game. Trust your guys on the outside. The flea flicker kind of burned them in that situation, but that's just because Spoon came up way too far. Uh, but I think the scheme is there. Like, I think they even simplified it a little more. They tried to run a lot of stuff. It looked like against the Rams. I mean, they played a lot of plays, so maybe that's part of it. But even today was a ton of plays as well. So, yeah, I think I think Clint's scheme is fine. Like, and I think – I think he's getting guys to buy into what they want to do. It's just not the secondary. I think they got to get the right pieces to play all at once. So, yeah, I, th I think, I think Clint should be fine. He should be got to get that secondary right though. If they get lit up by Bryce young and, and the glass, the glass will be kind of half empty. All right. This next one comes from Holly homegirl, Holly at Holly Keith. Oh, six thoughts on the way the offensive line played without Abe and Cross. Yeah, I I, I thought I when before we recorded just now, I went back and watched um, as many of the pass rush snaps I could um before we hopped on. Yeah, I thought I thought the use of play action uh was really good like you mentioned, Chris. Um and I had a player tell me it would probably be like that because I told him uh, I don't know why I just be giving these guys suggestions like they're gonna listen, but I was like, <laughs> you guys should use I like you if you guys are gonna have backup tackles, you gotta use play action under center more like you guys do when you have drew lock in the game drew lock basically they just run the 
Jared Goff play action offense when he's in. Um, and they don't really as much with Geno because he doesn't need it and he trusts his tackles. Not to say Geno doesn't trust Stone and Jake, but it's like, at least go out there and try it. And you saw those plays to Disley. You saw those plays to Noah and Colby like, oh, that's great. That works. Let's do more of that. Uh, but then I liked that Shane after a while was like, yo, these guys are fine. I thought Jake Curran did a really good job today. Like a really, uh, really good play I like from Jake. It's not going to end up on the highlights or anything because Gino ends up throwing it away on third and 10, but it was in the red zone. I think it's before one of the missed field goals. Um, Aiden tries like three different moves on him <laughs> and he just wins. Gino had time. He just hadn't had nobody open. So that was just a really good example. Like, yo, Jake is fine. Uh, looked at Stones, like Stones holding up just just fine. Now, some better pass rushers may give him some issues. Like, you know, you still got Hassan Reddick, Nick Bosa, um, Miles Garrett, and Micah Parsons all on the schedule. God damn, that's a schedule, boy. I ain't, I hadn't said all of those at once. Oh my god, I got to play Brian Burns too. Like, Next week. <laughs> yeah, that's. Oh my god, actually, it's a. That's it's a challenge. Actually, that could get spooky, uh, but. I say that, and then they got T.J. Watt too. Did they play the Steelers? They no, do. they, play, they do. Oh, they the play last game. Like, no, what is the second like Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve or something like I that? I think it's the last yeah. game, but it's close. But I, I feel you. Go ahead. Now, the bad. last game is always a division game, so it must be like the, the game second before. to last. Yeah. Either way, they got some rushers on there that on the schedule. I ha- I hadn't peeped that um, until now, but anyway. So I do think better rushes maybe will give more more of a challenge, but just off first watch, I thought in the past game specifically. Those guys held up really well. I mean, look at – give another example. Um, actually, we have a video of that. Can you pull up the, the, the DK? Pull up the DK uh, catching overtime. For our people who are on YouTube, this is the the third and six where uh, it's in overtime. Uh, the Seahawks are, like, on their own, like four, they're on their own 46 or something like that, their own 45. They really need to convert here because I'm sure we all would have felt like if they punted, the Lions were going to go down and score. And what you can see is just, like, DJ Dallas was going to give some help to Jake, and he was like, nah, Jake. You got it. Spread your wings and fly. <laughs> He's like, you got Aiden Hutchison. And he anchors down. Uh, hey, uh, Aiden tries to rip through. He's got that move, too. And you could just look at Gino. Trust him. I mean, if you're just listening to it on our Spotify, obviously, or something, you can't you can't see it. But, man, our people who are on YouTube, you can see this. Gino is just so confident, so calm in there. Like, he takes his drop. And it's like, sit there, sit there, sit there, scan, scan, uh, dart to, to DK. That right there... If if you if you are have any questions about Jake, I think that it's like because Abe Lucas is going to be out for a while, obviously because he's on IR. So that's like the bigger concern long term than Charles, who could be back as early as next week. But if you're worried about Jake, just put that play on loop. Like that's that's it right there. That's the type of stuff Jake can do. So uh, I, I was really impressed with both on first watch. Um, I mean, Pete Carroll said those are the first two dudes that he went and hugged after the game were were, were Jake and Stone. Like. You could you could really you could really feel that um, they they played really well. Shout out to them. It wasn't like their first game. They're not rookies, and I think they're both in year three. But yeah, that was that was really impressive uh, stuff there to get left on an island. It's not like they just got their hands held all game. Eventually, Shane was like, "Huh, I can just let you guys rock. Go ahead." Um, so yeah, good job by them. This next one. So I screwed up. We had one more defensive question. I screwed up and went to offense. My bad. But. This one comes from Dom Ha. How would you describe Devin Witherspoon's first game and his impact on the secondary? Yeah, I thought Devin, he'd look like a, a rookie. Um, the DPI was a little a little questionable because um, the guy just runs into him. So then the collision makes it look like Devin did something. It's like, dude, the reason that his momentum slowed is because he ran into me. But I see why they call that. So um, I think that... The, can you pull up the, the clip of the fourth and four though? This is a, this is a really good play because this is a tough route. Um, so Devin has to come all the way across the field, get all the way through traffic um, to knock this down on fourth and four. Um, and he's got the tight end. So like, it's an easy player to come pick up, but for Devin to come, it looks like they try to rub him off with the Amon Ross same round route in motion. Then he has to navigate uh Derek Hall who drops into coverage and still make the play. Nah, I thought, I thought that was, that was some impressive stuff by Spoon, man. That was one of those, oh, okay, he's that guy. He also had a really good open field tackle, I think, before the flea flicker. Uh, oh, yeah. Like no gain yeah. or something or for mm-hmm. one yard. I thought that was that was really good. But you can't give up that flea flicker, and you can't get that DPI. Um, so I do think that, like I said, he looked like a rookie. He looked like he made some mistakes. 
He had some really good plays. He was also targeted on the other fourth down uh, play that they did not convert. They were one of three on fourth down. So, yeah, I thought Spoon showed the flashes that you would want to see from a high pick in his very first game, like very first at all because he didn't play in the preseason. Like, keep that in mind as well. I need to see the all 22, get a better look at it um, and sit down. I'll try to watch it on the plane or something like that. But off first glance and watching, rewatching some of the broadcast copy before we recorded, I was like, yeah, number 21 can play. Like he's, he's fast. Like even the recovery on the flea flicker was good for how bad he's beat to how close he gets. By the time the ball is there, you look, Oh, he got wheels too. Um, and he ain't afraid to tackle. So yeah, I think, I think he'll be okay. I'll be very curious to see how he looks against the Panthers because uh, now they have some film on him as well. So, um, and Frank Reich's a good coach over there. So, you know, they'll have some stuff. So, but I, I thought it was a, it was a decent enough, you know, debut by Spoon. This next one comes from Jeff R. Is Jason Peters a lock to start over Curhan or Forsyth? As we both alluded to, they look great on Sunday against the Lions. Uh, I think the goal is get, to get Charles Cross back. Remember, Charles is not on IR, so Charles can just come back. Um, and I do think after the way Stone and, and Jake played today, we could be looking at a situation very similar to, if you guys remember when Damon Snacks Harrison came in um, to play Nose that one year, I think it was the, co- the first COVID year. Um he he didn't get in the game for a long time, and I think he eventually ended up asking to be released. And part of that is because they came in thinking, dang, we're shorthanded. We need a nose. I forget what happened to need snacks. But then I think it was like Brian Monet started playing really well. If somebody started playing really well, maybe it was Puna. I can't remember. But it got to the point where it was like, oh, we don't we don't actually need you, man. I'm sorry. Um, we had you fly over across the country to, to come over here. But we actually – our young guys are better than we thought. I could see that that happen. Now, this version of Jason Peters is probably better than this version of Stone. So, yeah, Jake, uh, Jason Peters could step in for either one of those guys. But if you're Pete Carroll, you're probably like, Jake, we trust you against the Panthers. Um, Stone, we can roll cross. We want to roll you out there against the Panthers if you're ready to go. And if not, we're cool with Stone. I think today, if you're the Seahawks, it made it so you don't have to rush Jason Peters. Uh, you can say, hey, man, hey, big man, you're not ready yet. That's cool. Stay on the practice squad. Our young guys can handle it. I think that – so I wouldn't call Jason a lock. I think you can wait a little bit. This next one comes from Zach Nixon. Thoughts on why the Seahawks stall in the red zone on offense? Uh, I don't – hold on. I might have to reject that premise here. Whose name was – whose name access that? Zach Nixon. Yeah, I don't know. They got to the red zone. What, five times today and scored four touchdowns. That's about as about as good as he is. Let me see. Yep. Scored from the one. Missed a field goal. But that was from the 27s, not the red zone. Scored from the three. Stalled at the seven and kicked a field goal. But I, I think that might be where Gino got the intentional grounding. Because the... Can we talk about how mad Pete was on the grounding call? We're going to ignore the question a little bit. Because I think they were four or five from touchdowns in the he red was. zone. So they, it ain't like they just stalling in there. Pete on that grounding call. I don't, Chris. I don't know if I've ever seen him that mad like that. I didn't know that he could fight somebody. Yeah, that was. I think that might have been the worst, the most pissed I've seen Pete. I saw the f bombs. That's BS. I said, "Damn, Pete is mad about that play." And to be fair, he had every right. Intentional grounding. The rule is not what Gino did. He literally had a miscommunication with Tyler Lockett. Who was supposed to run a fade route? He ran an out route. He was expecting the ball for Tyler to be in the end zone. He wasn't. There was no pressure. Gino didn't throw it away, thinking, "Oh my gosh, I'm going to get sacked." Gino was throwing for a touchdown, but the refs saw it differently, obviously, and then they called intentional grounding. And Pete was irate, as he should have been. But you know, one thing I've realized: Do NFL coaches? One thing that I've realized: I don't think NFL coaches get tossed for game out of games, do they? No matter how that, egregious. That is a good question. I, I don't think I've seen it, no. Because in the NBA, if a head coach went off similarly, he'd been tossed. In the yeah, NFL, baseball though, too. You get you get rang up in baseball, you're out of there. Yeah, yeah so I think too. in the NFL, you're a lot. You, you, I've never seen an NFL coach be ejected outside of Tomlin for sticking his knee out when the dude was doing a kick return. Oh, he got ejected for that? I think it was Jacoby I, Jones. Yeah, I think he did get Ravens. ejected. I think, I, think that, I think that's the only time I remember a coach being ejected, if he did. I have to go back and double check that, but I don't think coaches get ejected for just cursing out officials, which is crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah, he looks. It looks like he did not 
get ejected for that. He was fined a lot of money. It looks like a hundred thousand dollars. Um, but he didn't get ejected. Like, okay, doesn't look like it. Just reading some headlines on Google that I looked up while you were talking. Uh, so, <laughs> but yeah, that's a good. I, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, they don't really get the boot. Um, no, they don't. You can mother yes, boot that's and they're just. I mean, it was warranted right there, too. Oh, it's it like, was. But... Clearly not intentional <laughs> grounding. There was nothing intentional about Gino throwing the ball over there. I'm clearly he thought Tyler was going to run over there. Intentional is just the dumbest way to – when I tweeted that, I was like, remember, the rule is intentional grounding. <laughs> like, there's no way in hell he's just trying to get rid of it because he's scared. Oh, no, man, he's trying to throw a touchdown to his, to his mans. And he ran the wrong route. Or Gino threw the wrong ball. I don't know who was actually in the wrong. My guess would be Tyler. Uh, but I, I don't know. I didn't ask anybody. But. Yeah, I, I've never seen Pete that bad though. He was pissed. He was yeah. Pissed. This next one comes from Jome Twenty. Let's see here. How do I phrase this? Dan Campbell is praised for taking fourth down risk, but it burned the Lions multiple times. Pete mixed it up. When it comes to coaching, should Pete get credit for making smarter in-game decisions than Dan Campbell? Uh oh, I don't know about that. I actually didn't mind Dan's going forward on fourth down. I think one of them probably he should have maybe punted. Um, the one, the one, the one they failed. Yeah, where the failing gave the Seahawks the ball on Detroit's like forty-five, and then the Seahawks went down and scored a touchdown. Like that was that was kind of tough. Uh, I, I I mean, you guys know me. I, I'll go for it any time. But that one, I can see why Lions fans are like, dude, dude, what are you doing? Make them go the length of the field. Like, come on. I I, I, I understand um, on, on that one. But I will say, um, Pete, Pete be making some weird stuff too. Like today, why would you go for it? Or why would you line up to do the hard count thing on fourth and three and then use a timeout after instead before you punt? They could have used that timeout later when they were on their field goal drive later. Now, Jason missed the field goal, so that might not even matter. But why would you – why not just take the delay a game if you're going to do that? You just burned a timeout for no reason. Like, stuff like that still getting to me. Um, allowing Shane to call screens. Talk about decisions. That is just – you need to go ahead and just veto that right there, buddy. Uh, go ahead and, uh, hey, guys. You guys knew it was coming. I did, too. It's okay. Yeah. Um no, I, I think I like Dan's aggressiveness. Um, he's going for it. it the, uh, he's got the – they're creative enough with their play calls. Oh, the one I that named Brown was beautiful. I, that Excellent. was nice. The one where golf – they sent a guy in motion, and then Amon comes running in, and they hand it to Amon for a little up-the-gut run for four yards for the first down. For first oh, that down. was good. Yeah, that I love that play because I was thinking, what are, they, what are they drawing up here? And it worked. The hole was wide open because they sent, I think it was Gibbs in motion. Yeah. And obviously you got to respect Gibbs out of the backfield. And that's what the Seahawks were thinking. Oh, it's something there. But instead, Amon was in the slot and he came right across. Goff handed it to him, which is a running play to same Brown after he's been banged up. So that was a really cool play. So I guess to back up your point, I understand why he was going for it in certain scenarios. But I agree on that one where they were at the midfield. I would have punted it. Straight up, because the C the Lions had the lead at that point. And to your point, yeah, just make the Seahawks march down the field and score if that's what you want to do. Because nine times out of ten, I would assume Pete's probably gonna go for it. They needed some points. They were desperate. They needed something. And if you're gonna make them drive ninety yards and it's fourth and three, the Seahawks are likely gonna go for it because they need a touchdown. They can't afford to put Myers out there and go for a field a field goal because he's been struggling up to that point. Yeah, also, another decision I thought was a little weird. I, I kind of get it, but they had third and goal from the seven. Uh, I forget what the score was at the time. I think they were just down a touchdown. Um, but they just – it was the play where Jenna almost throws an interception, trying to throw it to Smith. Oh, the out route? Mm -hmm. I thought they could have probably afforded to leave Ken Walker in for third down. I think DJ came on the field. Leave Ken Walker in. Um, maybe even look at how the, the, the Lions line up. Maybe run the ball. So even if you only get five yards, go for it on fourth and two um, instead of try to get it all on the on the seven. Um, but that who knows? That might have been a shame thing. I'm not really sure. But no, I think I think the way the way Dan's doing it is fine over there. I think he's a good coach. Um, he's got his guys, you know, wanting to run through a wall for him. To just to, they just don't want to get a stop in overtime for him. So he's got to <laughs> fix that part, um, I guess. But yeah, I, I don't think one guy was like out coached the other one drastically with in game stuff today. I, especially with yeah, 
you know, I'm sure you guys, you Seahawks fans, you guys are probably cussing out Pete at some points during the game. You know you were. Lions fans are cussing Dan out right now, too, mostly because they lost. But I'm sure you guys were cussing Pete out today, too. Though. Yeah. Both of those guys made some some questionable calls today. We got another gentleman from over the water. This is from Steve Campbell. Do you guys think that all fields should be played on grass? Where's Steve from? He said he's across the water. You know, I see a flag and boy. Oh, you just, oh, okay. <laughs> you just don't know where the flag from. You just know it's not even the best flag. Uh, here, here's what I'm going to do, Mike. I'm gonna send, I think it's Sweden. I'm pretty sure it's Sweden. No, it's okay. We don't got to guess. It's okay. No. I just was curious because you, you say it's over the water. I'm like, where? But no, that's fine. If you just know. Uh, oh, that might just be a UK flag. I can't, I can't tell what the flag you're saying. It's okay. It's okay. Though. It doesn't really matter. Uh, sorry. Someone wasn't paying question? attention in class. This is, do you think all fields should be played on grass? Yeah, man. I feel really bad for these guys who get these turf injuries, man. Like, And it's crazy because the players are so adamant about, yeah, grass, 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 grass. Um, and the owners are just like, no. And mm. It's just like, come on, man. We can we can afford we can afford to play on grass. So um yeah, I think so. Whatever's the healthiest for the players. I haven't really done it, dug into all of those surveys and stuff like that. I just know everything the players tell I me, and even the coaches admitted too, like grass has been proven to be healthier for their guys, uh, better for them, softer landings, stuff like that, better for like uh, better on their knees and everything too. Um you see guys blowing out stuff, particularly on some like sp very specific turfs too, like MetLife claims a lot of lives up there in New York. I really hope the Seahawks and the Giants get out of there safe because uh, MetLife turf got a bad rep. I don't know what they're playing on at the Commander Stadium, but that stadium has a bad rep as well. SoFi Stadium, pretty tough on guys too. Um, guys' knees just explode at SoFi. So yeah, I, I'm of the opinion based on what I've been hearing over the years. It's ain't like a new thing, but what I've been hearing over the years is yeah, these guys should be these guys should be playing on grass, man. This turf stuff is not, is, is not the, the safest for these guys. Shout out to Google. Australia. There it is. So shout out to Mr. Campbell from Australia for the question. We appreciate all the love and support. <clears throat> this one comes from Chris Hamilton. What is the current team's biggest strength? I really think it's the, it's the throwing game led by Gino, man. Uh, I, I really think he's been on it. His decision-making is really solid um, and he's really accurate. I mean, he, he had, he, he had some sprays against the Rams, particularly on the deep ball, which is really uncharacteristic. Um, and his overall body of work, though, I do think he's solid. really good decisions, decent enough athlete. Um, like he kind of qualifies in like the sneaky athletic character category, even though he's black. Um, like he just, he just feels sneaky athletic. Like when he takes off sometimes like, oh man, he can move, huh? Because mostly he's a pocket guy. He can, he can stand back there and throw. So, um, I think that's the biggest. And then we all knew that going in, but playing without the tackles was like, oh, okay. Now we can we can actually do this. And part of that, Gino gets a lot of credit for that too. His pocket presence today was outstanding. Like he was he was getting out of trouble when it was there, he's getting rid of the ball. The one sack, he's only been sacked once this year, right? I thought, oh no, no, no. Sorry. He got sacked a couple times in the Rams game at the end because it was second in a million and third in a million. But today, like he was operating within the flow of the offense and then just decided to add a bonehead play, which is crazy. Uh, that was really bad. You just should have thrown it away. But if 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 the worst thing was taking a really bad sack, um, yeah, I think he had a solid day. But also, when I just watch the films too, I just see like, man, this guy is making the right decisions based on the reads. It's not too often I'm looking like, damn, why you throw it there? Or oh, they got you. They they changed the coverage. Now for the most part, like even today, he had some ones where he had guys right in his face, floated one to Colby, I think, over two defenders. Like, yeah, I, he's a uh, he's on he's on. I think that's that's the strength, and it's going to be the strength going forward. His next one comes from Chris Lee. Where's the spot to get a Seattle style dog? He's coming out here for a game next week, Mike. What you got for him? Okay, I don't know the 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 street name, but my favorite spot because I'm not really a red meat guy, so I always get the chicken dogs. But there's a place that got the chicken dogs. Uh, if you go to the, it's right it's right by Cal Anderson Park. Uh, there's a club called Rhino Room, like Kitty Corner, like diagonal on the block is a hot dog stand. They got my favorite, not just because they got the chicken dogs, but they got my favorite Seattle dogs uh, on Capitol Hill in Seattle. I forget what street. That might be Broadway or John or something like that. I can't. It's like 12th and something maybe. It's, it's up there. You'll see. Cal Anderson Park right across the street. Um, 
that's that's the that's the one. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. And send me a picture when you when you get it too. Can't wait to see it. This last one comes from Michael at McNewhouse. Mike, what does your setup look like on game day? Computer and phone, two phones, a pad of paper, phone and computer. What is your experience on game day as a member of the press? Um, it starts with getting lost, getting into visiting stadiums. That's usually tough. Um, I was wandering. The reason why I was able to see Detroit fans in ski masks today, because I was wandering around the concourse trying to find out where how to get to the press entrance. Because the thing that I've learned as a media person is people are really confident telling you where to go, even if they actually don't know. Like mm. they tell me with confidence the wrong thing quite a bit. I'm like, oh, yeah, you need to just go to gate, gate G. Bust a left, go up the stairs, escalator. Oh, you're right where you need to be. I'll do all that stuff to the T. Get there, and they'll be like, nah, man, you need to go down to, to the second floor, cross this bridge, go over there. And it's like, okay, y'all, y'all killing me. Um, if y'all don't know what you're talking about, just say it. So I got a little lost today. I did run into Cliff Averill on the way. Um, he was at the game. I don't know if they showed him or anything on, on TV, but uh, Cliff was there. I said, who are you rooting for? You know, because Cliff played for the Lions. He was like, I'm neutral today. Neutral. So, um, which which is fair. Cliff really enjoyed his time with Detroit, so um, so that was that was cool. Um, but yeah, during the game, I have open. I've opened a lot of tabs. Like right now, I have one, two, three, four, five, including the stream that we're on. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen tabs open. That's about normal. Um, I always have my Twitter open. Um, I always have like True Media. If you guys read my stories, you see I'm always citing True Media. They do like live box score update with some of this like. Some of these splits I can look at, like, oh, here's what the running backs did, or here's what the third down numbers were, or here's how many throws were play action. Like, I can find all that stuff a lot easier on True Media. I always have two of those tabs open. I have another one um, that allows me to kind of, like, replay some of the clips. Uh, I have another one open that tracks the game, too. This is the Seahawks site. And then also I'm charting every play on my notepad by hand as well. Um so, yeah, what is that? That's just one screen. I'm not usually on my phone too much. I just use my phone and just, like, I put all my group chats on mute usually during the Sundays because they they be going crazy between fantasy and just having a lot of friends who are Seahawks fans. Just I'm usually going crazy. I'm usually really only texting um, mostly Chris and my editor, uh, mostly. A few <laughs> homies here and there. A few homies in my, like, one other group chat, but then mostly just, like, Chris and my editor, like I would just, I'll just send Chris a note. I think I, I think I said something. I think I had several uh, anti Julian Love texts to Chris today, because uh, he was just, just a problem on some of these. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's it. Um, and then when I go down to the locker room, uh, I'm always trying to um, make that decision. Like, okay, when do I go to the guys who are on the podium? Do I want do I want people to feel like what's happening in the locker room? Like after a win, usually lean towards the locker room after a loss, like I guess the Rams. I really didn't talk to that many guys in the locker room. I just got most of the podium stuff. So it's a it's a decent mix. Today I spent a lot of time just kind of chatting with dudes off the record, laughing about stuff. Um, you know, just kind of gathering some seeing how what the locker room feels like after a win or a loss. Um, so like today, if you notice in my story, I didn't have a lot of quotes from Tyler. Actually, I didn't have any because I didn't go to his press conference. I missed Gino. Uh, I missed in Pete's entire one. And who else went? Bobby. I missed Bobby and Trey Brown. So because I wanted to get in the locker room, thankfully, I ended up talking to Trey and Bobby in the locker room. Um, and on top of them going, but I have quotes from like Diggs and Parkinson and Fant and DK, Jackson Smith and Jigba, DJ Dallas. So I love getting the feel of, I want you, I told my editor this too, like my goal is always to, I want my readers to feel like they're reading something from a guy who was there. That however I can convey that. So at the games, I got all these tabs up and everything. But when I go down there, I'm like, all right, when I write my stuff, how do I make you guys feel like you were there? What did I see? What was the music like? You know, um, like who, who did what? Like the opening of my story today is Tyler Lockett in full uniform trying to go to the podium and DJ Dallas just bear hugging him while he still got his pads on. Like, no, man, I love you. Like, you the man out here. Like, you know, those type of scenes to make you guys feel like I was there. So, yeah, that's that's my setup. Mute my phone mostly. Uh, just mostly to text Chris and my editor. Um, and then I just check my fantasy leagues. When I get home, I should be four and zero today, baby. Uh, here we go. Love it, love it, love it. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of how my my game day setup looks. Well, there it is, Mike's game day setup. That is the Seahawks Man to Man Pod. We appreciate all of you for watching, listening on YouTube, Athletic, 
Spotify, Apple, and wherever else you get your podcasts. We'll come back next week after the Seahawks and Panthers game. Mike, is there anything you want to add before we get out of here? I just want to echo the the love and support. Really do appreciate it. We in the full swing of things. We love all the questions. We love all the tweets. Love when you guys stop us, uh, you know, um, on the street and on the street or whatever. You know, when you guys I see you guys out, someone delivered something to my house the other day. The delivery guy knew that he listens to he listened to the pod. Um, or we playing heard flag us, football and he, he heard us on the radio or something. Oh yeah, when we play flag, somebody like, hey, I listen to the show. Like we we do love all that. We appreciate it so much. So, so if you guys see us or even if you tweet us, whatever, you leave a comment. We see it all. We appreciate it all. So, you know, we're here for you guys doing this show completely for y'all. So appreciate the love and support. We will catch you guys next week, as Chris said. Until then, enjoy the week. We're out.